Welcome and thank you for joining our webinar, Designing with Your Ears, a talk with Julian Treasure. Julian Treasure is an expert on sound and the impact it has on our daily lives. He's also a sought after international speaker with five TED Talks, all on various aspects of sound and communication. Collectively, these five TED Talks have over 18 million views. For the webinar today, we asked Julian to share his thoughts on designing spaces with sound in mind. After Julian's talk, we will turn the presentation over to Jeff Brewer. Jeff is the brand manager for Asa Abloy Architectural Accessories. He will briefly show us some of the acoustic solutions from Asa Abloy. And now here is Julian Treasure. Well, hello, my name is Julian Treasure and I'm delighted Asa Abloy have given me the opportunity to share with you some thoughts about sound and design. In fact, the talk is called Designing for the Ears and without further ado, uh, let me go straight into sharing the screen. I have to share some computer sound as well. Uh, so just do this and then do this. And you should now have a nice full screen picture. Designing with our ears, it's um, really very common that we design, we think of design just with the eyes and yet actually we design for all the senses, and that's really what this talk is about. Uh, let me start just by introducing myself. So as I said, my name is Julian Treasure. I run a company called The Sound Agency. The Sound Agency is an audio branding company. So we work around the world with brands. Here are some of them. We're asking those brands the question, how does your brand sound? Which is a question, again, that many brands don't think about. Answering that question, hopefully, very well in lots of countries around the world. Along the way, I wrote a book. The book is called Sound Business, and it's about all uses of sound in business. And we get covered a great deal in the media, uh, which tends to indicate to me that people find sound interesting, as do the viewing figures for my talks on TED.com. Uh, I'm sure many of you have come across TED. It's a wonderful conference. If you haven't, then do check it out, TED.com. 2,000 talks, all free, on everything from black holes to jazz music. I have five on there, all about sound. Um, the most watched one i think is about 6.4 million views now and in total something like 20 million views estimated on the internet for those talks uh, and that that again tends to indicate to me that people find sound interesting let's start but most of us find noise like this pretty unpleasant we stand on street corners shouting over the top of noise like this and pretending that it doesn't exist but it does exist and it has an effect on us. The trouble is because we get so used to suppressing that kind of noise around us, we get into the habit of just ignoring sound. Most of us have a relationship with sound, which is a little bit like this. And yet sound does affect us in four very profound ways. And I'm just gonna go through those four ways with you right now. Well, this is the first one, physiologically. Sound is changing your uh, hormone secretions, and I just did that with you. That was a sudden noise which caused a release of cortisol, your fight-flight hormone. Sorry about that. Uh, if you have an alarm clock at home that sounds like that, I do advise you to change it. It's not very good for you to have sudden noises like that waking you up. <coughs> Excuse me. So physiologically, sound is changing our hormone secretions. It's changing also our breathing, our heart rate, even our brain waves. If I put, uh, put this sound on, for example, uh, this is surf roughly 12 cycles a minute, a very gentle sound, very good if you have trouble sleeping, by the way, and a sound we associate with being relaxed. So this would reduce your heart rate again in the stimulation I just gave you. And if I left it on long enough, you'd start to feel pretty sleepy, I think. So that's the first way sound affects all of us physiologically. Here's the second. Psychologically. Sound changes our moods, our feelings, our emotions. We all know that music does that, and music is, of course, just a, a very specialized form of intentional sound. But music's not the only sound that changes our feelings. We use birdsong a great deal at the Sound Agency because many people find birdsong reassuring at a very deep level. That's because we've learned over hundreds of thousands of years that when the birds are singing, we're safe, generally. It's only if something is very bad is about to happen that the birds will suddenly stop singing and if they do that, well, that's not a very good moment, is it? You know that uh, that means something nasty is on the way. So that's the second way sound affects us. It affects our feelings. The third way is cognitive. If you you're listening to this version of me, you're on the wrong the same track. Time, or in this case, Try listening to the other one. Twice. It's not possible. 
Nobody can understand two people talking at the same time, or very, very few people on this planet can. Most of us have bandwidth for around 1.6 to 1.8 human conversations. And we don't have ear lids. So if you work in an office that sounds like this, particularly if you can hear one conversation nearby, it is incredibly degrading your productivity. This is how degrading. And this is a really serious issue because uh, open plan offices are being uh, rolled out as if it were the solution for all kinds of working. Well, we'll talk about that a little bit later on and ways of improving the way we design offices for the ears. The fourth way sound affects us is behaviorally. Of course it does with all that other stuff going on. At the most simple level, we will move away from unpleasant sound if we can. So if I were to leave this sound on for the next half hour, so I don't think you stay in this webinar, you'd be off doing something with a much more pleasant sound. If we can't move away from sound like that, it's incredibly damaging to our health, actually. And this is a major social problem now uh, across the world. Here's a number from Europe, which I find deeply disturbing. Tra traffic noise disturbing people's sleep severely. And that 2% doesn't sound like an awful lot until you realize it's 8 million people in Western Europe. Now, I can tell you the situation is exactly the same in North America, if not worse. The estimates I've seen are that there are some, something like 100 million people in North America whose health is being affected by ambient noise levels, largely traffic noise. It may be aircraft trains, cars, construction, heavy industry. All of these noises are contributing to a major social health problem. Now, in retail, this is where the sound agency does a lot of work these days, uh, this is a really big issue because if we make a nasty noise in a shop, people will leave. They won't complain. Nine times out of 10, they won't complain. They'll just go or leave sooner than they otherwise would. And that reduces sales. So what we have to look at is making a much more pleasant retail environment for the ears and then we increase dwell time and sales will be maintained. So I'm, uh, through this talk, I'm gonna give you some little aid memoir slides like this, uh, where we just pull out the, the, the key things from the last section. And here are the key ones from this. You might want to take a photograph of this. The four ways sound affects us, physiological, psychological, cognitive, and behavioral. So that's well-being which is a really big issue for organizations in the world today. Happiness, morale in terms of team behavior, productivity, uh, which of course is very important, and also uh, behavioral uh, aspects, which are very, very key if you're designing retail. They also play out in offices and other places too. Now, it's impossible to take uh, one sense on its own because the senses affect one another and this is called cross-modal effects and this is being researched around the world now. Here's an example of a cross-modal effect. I'd like you please to look at the screen and listen to what this guy is saying. Ba 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 Now you're probably hearing da da if you now close your eyes, ba, 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 and listen. Ba, ba. Ah, he's saying ba, ba, isn't he? If with your eyes shut. Ba, 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 ba. Now look at the screen again, and you will see da, da. Your ba, actually, what he's ba, saying on the video is gaga. Ga. So your ba, eyes see gaga, ga, your ears ba. hear ba, ba, and your brain says that's da, da. Ba, ba. This is called the McGurk illusion ba, that works ba. for about eight out of ten ba. people. So I've just shown you that what you hear is not, is not necessarily reality. Well, of course, reality doesn't exist. We make it up. It's uh, all happening between our ears. It's called perception. And here's another very nice example. When this product had to change its um, mechanism because CFCs were banned. You remember the chemical that used to be in aerosols? So they used to make aerosols. Um, in this case, the, the product used to go and then CFCs were removed and it started going and the customers started to complain that the product was no longer working. It wasn't as strong as it used to be. It wasn't as effective. So they spent a lot of money repackaging it without CFCs. It now goes again and it's working fine again. So the sound of the packaging in this case affects how well people think the product itself is working. If we line these things up, we get a thing called super additivity. And that is what architects, designers, anybody who's creating environments should be aiming at. That's the holy grail, where we line the senses up. And in the world of super additivity, one plus one is not two, it can be 10 or even 20 times the impact 
if you have congruent senses, senses all pointing in the same direction. Now here's a simple model of communication. We have a sender, we have a receiver. That happens in a context generally. And that context is by and large, sadly, a combination of noise and bad acoustics. Now that's a sweeping generalization I know, but it is generally the kind of environment we tend to communicate in in the modern world. The modern world has got very noisy. So let's have a look at how we can improve that. When we're designing environments at the sound agency, we think about four things. The four building blocks, if you like, of good sound in an environment. First, acoustics. All too often we come across environments where an acoustician has never been involved. Now, we're not acousticians, but we work with them. I do think acousticians sell themselves a bit short. Uh, they don't sell the joy of designing a beautiful acoustic space. They do tend to get brought in at the end of a process when there's a problem to solve and no money to solve it with, which means they have a pretty miserable life a lot of the time. Um, now, if we start thinking about acoustics at the very beginning, it's not very expensive to get them right, and we can move away from all hard surfaces and, and actually create contours, light and shade, acoustically speaking. Very hard to create good space in a room or a space that has terrible acoustics. Then we have noise sources. That's electromechanical noise, usually things like HVAC, heating, ventilation, uh, ventilation, air conditioning, uh, any kind of electromechanical noise in, in malls, for example, um, uh, you'd have things like escalators and travelators, and, uh, vending machines, all sorts of noises add to the noise floor in a space. Then we have the sound system. If we're going to make noise in a space and inject intentional sound, the sound system must be good enough to do that. And one of the biggest failings that we find in retail particularly is lousy sound systems really cheap sound systems that were installed simply to do alarms and then years later somebody says oh we've got some loudspeakers why don't we play music and the music is then put out through speakers that were never designed to do that and the result is a terrible sound of course then and only then do we think about content which may be music but i'm going to talk about music it very often should not be music uh, we can do more clever things with content than simply play music everywhere now let's talk about sound. This is kind of sound 101. You may know all this stuff, uh, but it's worth just reminding ourselves uh, of rat. When sound hits a surface, it'll do one of three things. And this is rat. Reflect, it'll bounce back. Uh, if the surface is hard, particularly, it'll do that. It might get absorbed if the surface is soft and absorbed means turned into heat energy, actually, because uh, of course the energy doesn't go away. Energy is always there. Uh, and the third thing it may do is go through the surface and transmit to the other side, uh, which is something we uh, tend to guard against in buildings. So that's the rat. And this is how it works in practice. Here's our surface. It might be a wall, it might be a floor, a ceiling, whatever it is. The sound hits the surface. Some of it is reflected back. Some of it is turned into heat and some of it goes through uh, and is transmitted to the other side. Now we measure these things uh, in America, the reflection, uh, the, the, the amount of absorb absorbency, in other words, the inverse of re reflection, tends to be measured by a thing called the noise reduction coefficient. Now there are different standards around the world, but let's work with NRC. It's a number between naught and one, and it, tends, it, it measures the absorbency of the surface. So something with NRC one across a, a variety of uh, frequency bands will absorb all the sound that hits it. Zero will bounce it all back. And on the other side, we have a sound transmission class measure, which uh, measures the attenuation. Now, this is the key, really, for the conversation today, the attenuation of that surface. Sound is very smart. I always think of sound almost as an intelligent being. It'll get through the tiniest hole. So if we're going to attenuate, in other words, reduce the noise level, let's say we have a meeting room and you don't want to hear everybody's conversation in the next room and you don't want them hearing your conversation, we need a barrier. That barrier needs to attenuate by a significant margin, which we measure in decibels. So for example, you might have a surface with NRC 0.7, that's absorbing 70% of the sound that hits it across those frequency bands. And we may have a surface that's got a sound transmission class of 40. That means it's 40 decibels quieter on the far side of the surface than it is where we're making the noise. Now that's pretty good. Uh, 40 is quite a lot because when you understand decibels, you understand that it's not a linear 
measure. It's a logarithmic measure, which means effectively every change of 10 decibels is a doubling or halving, if you're going down, of the noise level as we perceive it. 10 decibels, double. So if you go from 40 to 50, you're doubling the noise level. If you go down by 40 decibels, then you're down to half, quarter, sixteenth, one thirty-second of the original noise source, which is pretty significant attenuation. Here's a table of sound transmission classes. Um, it's, it's just a, a measure. Uh, it, it's kind of a rough guide, if you like, and you might want to take a photograph of this one if you haven't come across these so much before. Um, it's, it's a useful rule of thumb. You tend to want in an office, for example, something in the region of 40 plus, because otherwise you're into intelligible conversation or disturbing noises coming from the other side of the wall. Now, these things are important because if we have a room that's got bad acoustics, um, particularly, and maybe noise coming in from outside, you get a thing called the Lombard effect where, uh, you know, in a restaurant, uh, as it fills up, you start speaking more loudly, so I start speaking more loudly, so you start to, and it, it spirals up. That is the Lombard effect. Bad acoustics cause this upward spiral. You can reverse it if you have good acoustics and the room is damped down, then people tend to speak a little bit more quietly and everybody else can speak a bit more quietly too. And we end up with a thing we call the library effect, where it gets quieter more than the physics would tend to determine because people behave differently. So that's what happens with good acoustics. So really, ladies and gentlemen, in the architecture profession, this is about designing not just appearance, but experience in all five senses. Now, that's kind of exciting, I think, for you guys, because it gives you new toys to play with, uh, new materials to think about as well, not just uh, light and color and form, uh, but also and texture, but also sound. And how does a place actually feel uh, when we're in it? We tend to start, when we're thinking about sound in a space, we tend to start from here. Silence. The Elizabethans described conversation as decorated silence, and I think that's a lovely way to think about working with sound in space. Now, you could then think about it kind of like painting a great painting like this. The guys who painted, or, or females who painted that background, uh, I don't think that was Leonardo who did that, was it? It was School of Leonardo. Uh, his juniors would have been painting those trees in the full knowledge that nobody was really going to be looking at those trees very much. The trees are there to play a supporting role. They're just there to focus our attention on the face. Now we can do this in spaces with sound as well. We can have features where we do want people to pay attention and we can create background sound, which is not necessarily music because well, we'll come on to this, but music's main intention is to be listened to. We can create sound that's not uh, designed to be listened to, but is designed to be like oral wallpaper uh, and there in the background. Here's some examples of the kind of generative sound that we've created. This is played live by a computer system. It's designed to be not listened to, but there in the background. Glasgow Airport, our job was to reduce stress levels. This soundscape went in. Now you're experts in sound. You can hear a bit of bird song in there, makes people feel secure. The pace of this soundscape is very, very slow indeed. And the result? Well, the shops liked it because people bought more stuff. Presumably, they felt they had more time and they did a bit more shopping. So everybody wins in that situation. Here's another example in America, in the town of Lancaster, up there in the Mojave Desert, uh, not far from Los Angeles. Uh, we installed this soundscape down the main street, which is called the Boulevard. I don't know what happened to the vowels in Lancaster, California, but it is called the Boulevard. And uh, the sheriff reported after this soundscape went in, crime fell by 15%. Now, these things are not designed to be listened to. They're simply designed to create a lovely ambience, uh, uh, in those cases, a calming feeling. Of course, we could do a stimulating feeling. Um, we could make a horrible noise if we want people to move out of a space. Anything can be done. The important thing is they're designed to be ambient, just like white walls in a room. You know, we don't go into a room and say, wow, look at those white walls. They're there to support us. So here's the takeaways from this section. Super additivity, very powerful. It's line the senses up. Acoustics, noise, sound system, content. The four building blocks of good sound in a space. We're designing not just appearance, but experience. And sound does change people's behavior in all sorts of ways. So we do need to think about it. Let's move on to specifically to look at a few environments. I'm going to look at um, three or four environments that we are very familiar with and start with this one. And we, we all spend a lot of time in these places, don't we? 
sadly, the sound in these spaces is not very well designed, not very much thought of. Now, the modern office goes back to Taylorism in the early part of the 20th century, when Taylor thought, well, what a brilliant idea to apply industrial manufacturing principles to the office. So you have everybody on identical workstations in serried ranks. Um, by the way, I wonder if you can guess how many men there are in this rather uh, blurred photograph from the early office museum of a, I can't remember which company it is, but there's actually one man on this floor supervising the entire floor. Now, of course, Taylorism is long past. We wouldn't do that in the modern era, would we? Or would we? Sadly, neo-Taylorism is alive and well in the open plan office, where we've got this Six Sigma approach, you know, clean desks, hot desking, depersonalization. Um, all of these principles make it very hard for people to feel at home. They are being treated a little bit by, like battery hens. The reason for this is that we have conflated two very different things, cost saving and productivity. They are not the same thing. It may save money to cram people into smaller and smaller personal workspaces, but it is not increasing productivity. And these two things, if we conflate them, well, we end actually end up with misery, not productivity at all. Now, there is a lot of evidence that says we shouldn't do this neo-Taylorist approach of depersonalized minimal workspace. Here's some of the papers which show that this isn't a good idea, but wait, uh, here's some more papers. And I could go on, actually. There's plenty of research now which is showing this is not a very good way to treat people in office environments. Well, to be absolutely fair, I should also show you uh, the research which indicates it is a good idea to do this. Here it is. That's all of it. Not a single scientific paper has ever said that's a good idea. No wonder then that noise is the number one complaint in modern offices, in survey after survey. The biggest survey in the world is the Leesman Index. I do advise you to check it out if you haven't already found it. It's an omnibus survey which now has got tens of thousands of questionnaires. It gets over the problem of complaining, uh, comparing apples and pears, like productivity, what's the productivity of a creative director versus the productivity of an accountant. Uh, well, it gets over that by asking people what factors are important to you in your personal productivity and how satisfied are them are you with them in your office? So that's kind of universal. And noise is very significant on that survey. If you can see here in terms of importance, nearly uh, three quarters, well, more than three quarters of the survey say that noise in the office is a very important factor and less than a quarter of them are happy with it. They find it very unsatisfactory three quarters of them are, un, are dissatisfied and the same thing applies to quiet working space uh, it's important that it's there and not many of them are happy that there's enough of it now let me suggest uh, an approach based on the work of professor jeremy myerson at the royal college of art in london myerson's written some very interesting books about modern office design and the 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 metaphor of an office changing from a factory uh, too much more of a network uh, these days. In the modern office, Myerson distinguishes at least three core types of working. Collaboration, and in collaboration, open plan works very well. It's okay to interrupt me, to shout at me, uh, and to call across the office. That's the metaphor, that's the, the, that's the paradigm we're in of working, uh, where it's loose working and it's, it's uh, collaborative. But for concentration, that environment does not work at all. For concentration, we need a space where it's like a library. The rule is, shh, no talking here. And the third type of working that Myerson distinguishes is contemplation, which is more of a decompress. It might be after meetings where you just want to sit and chill. It might be thinking great thoughts uh, about what might be happening in the next six months or something. That's more of a Zen type space. And again, a pretty quiet one. Now, even in open plan, when we are dealing with collaborative, let's say we are putting people in an open plan space because they're collaborating, so we're correctly allocating the space. And incidentally, that is not generally the case. In an open plan office, it can be too quiet just as easily as it can be too loud. A pin quiet office is intimidating, isn't it? Because I can hear your conversation. If you pick up the phone and start talking to somebody, you're putting off everybody who can hear you, which is in a quiet office, everybody. So we can put off, we can take up one of the 1.6 conversations we've got bandwidth for and massively reduce the productivity of 10, 20 people at a time. On the other hand, if the office is too loud, 
it's bad for health. The research shows very clearly stress levels go up, that creates absenteeism, low morale, less helpful people, and again, it's hard to concentrate in just a large amount of noise, even if it's office babble and you can't distinguish a single conversation. There is a sweet spot somewhere in the middle. The sweet spot is about 45 to 55 decibels of babble, of, of background noise, stochastic sound, comprised of individual events that are too many to record, so we don't have, we don't have anything to pay attention to. It's just background babble. Could be white noise or pink noise that's often deployed in offices filtered pink noise i'm not a great fan of this it is artificial and i'm pretty sure that it's fatiguing over the course of a day to have this on all day we can wrap it though in something a little bit more natural um, here are three examples of very natural sound that we could wrap pink noise in the pink noise is very effective wrap it in some more natural sound and i think this is kind of the spoonful of sugar that makes the medicine go down wind water birds the three most natural sounds. They've been around on this planet a lot longer than we have, and we're very used to working to them. We don't find them disturbing at all. Let's talk about music for a moment, because music is sometimes deployed in offices. Now, music is a powerful sound. We recognize it fast, and we associate it strongly with things. So you may recognize this. Those of you who are over 30, probably. Uh, that's the first chord of Hard Day's Night by the Beatles, of course. I'm sure that all of you will associate this with something. Now that's one and a half seconds, two seconds of music, and it's a very powerful global association in that case. Now associations can be very personal. That's a problem because one person's glorious music is another person's awful noise. It's very difficult to deploy music into a space and have people agree on it. And music is extremely distracting. You may have teenage kids who tell you they can work much better, uh, they can do their homework far better with music on, on their headphones. No. They may do the homework at all, so that's an advantage. They may do it for longer because they're having a nicer time, but they will not be as productive because music is made to be listened to and it's saying all the time, listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. It's taking our cognition away, particularly vocal music or music that changes a lot. This applies to classical music just as much as to pop music. Classical music is enormously variable and it's calling attention all the time. The only kind of music that probably doesn't call attention is very slow paced ambient music or very repetitive like trance music or something like that, where we just say, I know what that's doing. I don't have to listen to it. What music is not is a veneer. And it's very dangerous to apply music in places where it's just being played theoretically as background sound. We can think of much better masking sounds than that. By the way, if you want to work in a noisy office or you know kids who have to work in a noisy kitchen, there's an app which you can download for free from the usual places which we designed. It's called Study. It costs absolutely nothing. It's 45 minutes of sound that, like you just heard, which is specifically psychophysiologically designed to help people to work. Some of the most common mistakes I find in offices. Now, you know, you guys are architects, you know these things, and I know there are budget constraints and so forth, but let's please not design meeting rooms which are hard boxes. This has got hard walls, hard floor, hard furniture, which incidentally makes a horrible noise when you move it across the hard floor. The acoustics and all square walls, please avoid parallel surfaces if it's at all possible to do so. Just a, a few degrees, two or three degrees out of parallel will avoid standing waves which get set, set up when you have two hard parallel uh, surfaces. This room sounded absolutely dreadful. That thing on the table has got no chance of, uh, uh, of being effective at all. And incidentally, when I was standing in this room, I could really clearly hear the conversation on the other side. So the attenuation was rubbish. It was a partition wall that did not go up to the concrete above. There was a big gap above it with no filler. So sound just jumps over those things. Even worse, possibly even worse, meeting rooms that aren't rooms at all, meeting spaces. Now, if anybody's having a meeting in one of these, they're putting off the people working at the desks nearby and vice versa. The people at the desks are having conversations. How do you get confidential meetings in places like this? Well, you don't. Uh, they're not particularly effective. Um, and uh, lack of quiet areas. We've, we, we, we've mentioned that so many offices don't provide quiet working space at all. Or if they do, it's a couple of pods for 100 people, which really isn't enough. Now, I should say it takes two, because if we take an approach of designing, we think about how much of the time of our people is going to be in contemplation, concentration, and collaboration, 
and we then allocate that proportion of the office to uh, office space, the floor space to those activities, people still have to move themselves to the right place. And that doesn't always happen. You know, often you'll find people sitting there trying to concentrate in an environment that simply isn't right for that because they just haven't thought about moving themselves. We have to give them the ability to do that, the, the, uh, the spaces to move to, and we have to educate people in moving themselves and becoming conscious uh, about the sound environment. So this is top up and bottom down. And it also means people taking responsibility for the noise they make. You know, that noisy person in the office who can't speak at less than 85 or 90 decibels and is really upsetting everybody around them. They may be high energy, they may be a great salesperson, but they probably need a room on their own uh, or at least to be moved to a space where people around them aren't going to be disturbed by noise. We need to take responsibility for the sound we're making. So takeaways from the office section here, noise, number one, complaint in offices. Open plan is really only good for collaboration and we need to hit that sweet spot in open plan offices and concentration and contemplation require quiet working spaces. Now let's move on to education. When I see a classroom that looks like this, I'm forced to ask myself this question. Now, I know you guys do have ears, of course, this is somewhat tongue in cheek, but when you think about the designs that you're doing, the projects that you're putting out there, have you really considered the way these spaces are going to feel to be in for the ears? Are you designing with and for the ears as much as for the eyes? Because just think of what that classroom is going to sound like filled with 20 or 30 kids who are doing group work. Not great, I would say. There is a lot of research on the effect of poor acoustics in particular in education. And of course, poor acoustics here, I'm kind of including attenuation from outside and from adjoining spaces. If noise in a classroom goes up, what happens is people find it harder to work and it's stressful for the kids and for the teachers. Lots of research on this now. Five decibel drop in noise contributes to reading and recall up 10%. These are significant numbers. Attention and memory up 3%. So that's a 50% drop in the noise level in the space. If we have poor attenuation, this kind of thing can happen. And this was widely reported at the time. I'm not sure anybody's doing very much about it. We need to attenuate from the outside because otherwise, if we're under a flight path, look at what happens to the kids who just happen to be in a school that's under a flight path as opposed to in a quiet place. They're months behind their peers just as a result of the noise. And this is a disturbing graph uh, to me from, again, Shield and uh, Here we have the degradation uh, as the, the, the space gets noisier, the reading scores go down for typical pupils, which is bad enough. But if you're talking about pupils who have got some, some kind of special educational needs, it's a disastrous effect. I mean, their reading scores go down to very minimal levels. So we are disadvantaging them even more than the average pupil. Here's an example of the approach which I think we need to get away from. This is a famous school uh, which was one of the academy program, multi-million pound build in the UK designed by a top architect who I won't name at the moment. And it was designed with a big central atrium as if it were a large office building. And that central atrium was ridiculous because there were no back walls on the classrooms. All the classrooms were open to the central atrium. The kids at the back of each classroom couldn't hear their teachers because of the noise of all of the classrooms feeding into that atrium. They had to go back and spend 600,000 pounds putting subdivisors, uh, subdividers in to make the space usable. People couldn't hear what was going on. There is a move towards open plan schools. Please let's not go there. I, I just constantly imagine people coming from third world countries to the Western world and saying, what are you doing? We're spending all our time putting walls into spaces so the kids can hear and you're taking them down. I know many open plan schools where acousticians have had to be brought in and huge amounts of money have had to be spent in order to make the space even basically workable. Because if you have two or three classes of kids being taught, especially with group work these days in great big barns of spaces, it really is hard for people to hear. 
even in a traditional classroom like this, if you're at row four, which is where this picture is taken and back, speech intelligibility is just 50%. Now who's at the back? The naughty kids. There are millions of kids going through education right now, unable to hear their education, which I think is a tragedy. You know, we spend all our time focusing on sending education. We never ask the question, are the kids receiving it? Are the acoustics in the classroom good enough for them to hear? And we certainly don't teach them how to listen, incidentally, which is a whole different topic. If you would like an edu education to uh, watering a garden, which I think is a reasonable approach, we are wasting a lot of water, ladies and gentlemen. And it's particularly bad for these groups. I've mentioned um, special needs or what the, the kids with impaired hearing, of which like, roughly 3% on any given day have permanent hearing impairment. The other 13% of that 16 is kids who've got glue ear or a cold or an ear infection on that particular day. They can't hear too well when the acoustics are terrible. English as a second language, or if whatever country you're in, your language as a second language, uh, well, in Europe and in the US, that can be more than 10% of the population. And introverts, if you look at Susan Cain's wonderful TED talk on quiet people who prefer quiet environments and quiet working to this manic group work and the, the uh, essential need to become a kind of extrovert and a leader, um, we're missing out on the power and the value of introverts by making this noise. Now, 65 decibels is quite loud. I would have to talk quite significantly louder than normal to get over the top of that, which I'm doing right now. This graph shows you the uh, noise levels in German schoolrooms. The black dots are the noise level. The red dots are the teacher's heart rate. The red dots are the teacher's heart rate. That is not good. Because the research shows that 65 decibels, when we're exposed to it over long periods of time, is bad for our health. In fact, it causes increased risk of myocardial infarction, that's heart attack. Teachers may well be shortening their lives by working in that environment all the time. They're certainly hurting themselves in other ways. This is a teacher in the UK who sued the British government or the local education authority because she completely lost her voice because of shouting day after day over the noise of kids, 150,000 pound compensation. Now, if we can reduce noise levels in schools, we not only do we comply with standards, which is a good thing where they apply. Um, in the UK, we don't really have uh, obligatory standards. We have suggested guidelines, if you like, and nobody's going around measuring if they're actually met, which is a, which is a shame. Uh, I expect that's the situation in many countries around the world because we don't pay much attention to acoustics in schools. So if there are standards, we comply to them. The atmosphere of calm allows the teacher to speak rather than shout. It's less stressful. The kids can hear, so it's more efficient. Less things have to be repeated, for example. You have better performance. You have people listening. You have group work uh, being actually more effective in quieter environments. And the quiet kids actually take part. So here are your takeaways for education. Noise, not good. It puts stress up it puts performance down. And many classrooms, I have to say, are simply not fit for purpose the way they're designed at the moment. 65 decibels is dangerous over a long period of time. Let's move on to leisure um, and the hospitality industry, uh, where again, noise is a significant issue. Now, I think many luxury brands these days are selling um, peace. I mean, peace is kind of the new uh, the new time, if you like. We've been selling save time, save time, save time for a long time. Now you're tending to find particularly luxury brands using slogans like the quietest cabin in the sky or uh, talking about me time and peace and so forth. Certainly in the leisure and hospitality industry, peace is what people are starting to focus on. Quality of sleep, uh, spas, uh, welcome and so forth. Uh, here's a lovely hotel I stayed in a couple of years ago. The uh, Don Cesar in St. Pete's Beach in Florida. Amazing hotel with a great history, uh, which is all to do with Cuba and um, nefarious people of various kinds. Now, when I arrived there, you would expect there to be some, some kind of maybe Cuban inspired or Latin kind of music um, really talking to the history of this place. But no, there was wild, I think it was Rihanna playing in the, uh, the portico as, as, the, as the cab dropped me off. Uh, a little later, I went into the lounge to do some work. What do people want to do in hotel lounges? One of two things, talk to each other or work generally. And 
dancing in the streets by Martha and the Vandellas, absolutely booming out at about 80 decibels. You couldn't work and you couldn't talk. I have no idea whose policy that was, but that's the kind of craziness which can happen if hotels don't think about it. And of course, it's not just the hotel imposing sound on people. If you have a room uh, which is unfortunate enough to be very close to these guys, uh, you, I'm sure, have had the experience of this at two o'clock in the morning when people are pouring out of some sort of party and you get this going on in the corridor right outside your room. Now in this situation, attenuation is absolutely critical because my room should be my castle and that is not the case. As you move down the corridor in American hotels, especially ice machines can be incredibly noisy. I mean, I have measured these at 80 decibels plus, And if your room is right across from one of those, it does disturb you a great deal. Um, then you have um, all sorts of other noises going on in, in hotels, creating an environment where people are unhappy. Now, this is a J.D. Power survey, which is done every year. That's a lot of guests, 60,000 guests. And you will notice that noise was uh, a problem for 18% of them, more than internet access, which was only a problem for 13% of them. And, uh, you know, we do tend to complain about internet access. 60% of people complained about that. But even though noise was a bigger problem, far less people complained about it because we just put up with it. Again, it's that old paradigm. We suppress it. Oh, it's so noisy in here. What can I do about it? I just accept it and I leave and I don't come back, probably. So it's the number one problem. It was the biggest complaint on that survey. It's the number one complaint on this enormous survey done by ReviewPro, which was 2.5 million guest reviews. What they did was they corralled all those guest reviews from um, the various services on the internet, and they looked at, it was nearly 6,000 hotels, 20 cities. What was the number one thing that people were complaining about, not at the hotel, but when they got back afterwards, they said, it was terrible, it was too noisy. The second thing was the elevators, and the third thing was strange smells. So those were the, th the three that pulled out of that survey, noise the number one. In the UK, there is a chain called Premier Inn and they've installed something they call show meters, uh, which are kind of decibel meters in the corridors in 620 hotels because they've had so many problems with people coming back late at night, making a lot of noise in the corridors. Um, and they've said it was the single biggest reason that guests gave for not getting a good night's sleep. Uh, they've tried everything, including giving late night revelers lollipops as they come in so that they don't make so much noise. Now, if my room is going to be my territory and I'm not gonna get disturbed by people outside, attenuation at that doorway is absolutely critical. The only way of not disturbing me is to attenuate because people will make noise outside the room. So for hotels, noise is the number one problem again. Guests don't complain about it very much at the time. They'll possibly complain about it on the internet afterwards, which is kind of the worst case scenario for hotels. The guest rooms need to be sanctuaries and that means attenuation of those doors. Let's move on to hospitals, where you would think if we go to hospital, we're gonna be treated in a beautiful, optimal environment. Sadly, no. Noise levels are rocketing in hospitals. Look at this graph, this is really disturbing. The daytime noise levels as measured in this study are around 72 decibels as compared to the World Health Organization recommended maximum of 35. By 1960, it had been uh, already up to 57 decibels and in 2005, 72 decibels, that's daytime. Nighttime, we've got 60 dB at night against 30 dB. Now, do you remember every increase of 10 decibels is doubling? So you might look at this graph and say, well, that's really bad. The noise levels are more than double what they should be. No, they're actually 12 times what they should be. Every 10 decibels, a doubling of the noise. And at night, eight times what they should be, according to the World Health Organization. This is a disastrous situation. It affects the accuracy of dispensing because people can't hear instructions and their concentration is being disturbed by the noise around them. Most of all, it affects recovery because we get well by sleeping. Sleep is how we recover. And how can anybody sleep in an environment that sounds like this? These are all threat sounds. Our body is telling us I'm, I'm in danger here. It affects both the quality and the quantity of our sleep. Sleep is compromised by noise. 
I am absolutely convinced that we could transform hospital and healthcare outcomes by paying attention to the sound of these spaces and we could transform the outcomes virtually overnight. You know, a hospital corridor doesn't have to look like this. I know if there are operating theatres and so forth, it's got to be absolutely sanitised and no, um, no infections whatsoever. But these may well be offices, office corridor. It's a paradigm that we've invented that hospitals look like this. They don't have to. So let's think about noise in healthcare and reduce it. That re requires training and changing nurses and doctors' behavior and all the stuff in the hospitals, changing trolleys, stopping telephone calls in the middle of the night, using silent pages. There are a lot of things involved here, but the acoustics and design of the spaces and the attenuation between them, really critical. Because otherwise, you can sit outside a doctor's office and absolutely clearly hear what's being said inside when that's a confidential conversation and we again need attenuation to make sure that doesn't happen. So to summarize, we have in the past really focused on aesthetics, security, reliability and value when we're thinking about door furniture, doors, you know, closures, uh, seals between rooms. I'm saying that those aren't the only factors in play. Actually, what else is in play is people's productivity, people's creativity because it's hard to be creative when there's noise and interruptions coming from around you, well-being, happiness and connectedness. All those things result from getting this right, getting good attenuation between spaces, designing the sound within spaces that it's, so that it's optimal. Acoustics, noise, sound system, content. These things all come from reducing noise levels and if we pay attention to this in our design, then we do a service to the entire world. Attenuation affects everything. Blocking is absolutely essential for all types of human behavior. I hope I've been able to enroll you in the idea that good sound actually, because of the way it works, is good business. It leaves people happier, healthier, and more productive. Thank you very much for paying attention to me. And uh, I believe I'm now handing back to Jeff from Asa Abloy. Thanks. Thank you, Julian, for a very thought-provoking talk on how sound affects us in the spaces that we design and occupy. For the next few minutes, I want to focus on the points that Julian made about sound attenuation and its importance. Uh, that gives me the opportunity to talk to you about the sponsor of today's talk. Uh, that's PEMCO, an Asa Abloy Group company. PEMCO is the leader in the development of sound sealing components for commercial door openings. Uh, PEMCO's products are engineered to meet and likely exceed the acoustic performance requirements of the spaces that you design. Today we heard about four types of built environments and how sound, when it becomes what we might call noise, can have a negative impact on the occupants of those environments. We heard about offices, schools, healthcare and hospitality, and I'll add one more, military um, and or government uh, environments. Uh, PEMCO has the products to help you achieve the acoustic performance necessary for all of these. Uh, the way that we can achieve these uh, requirements of these different environments is through the products that we've tested over the last 20 plus years. Uh, PEMCO has been developing and testing acoustic products to achieve the highest possible STC ratings for that amount of time. The results of this continuous testing is a vast amount of knowledge about how to design and manufacture the highest performing acoustic seals available in the commercial door industry today. We've even tested to an STC 57 while meeting uh, operational code requirements. Uh, what's an STC 57? Well, it's a really high performing opening, but let me put it into a little bit of perspective. I'll show you this chart you saw earlier during Julian's talk, um, and it goes all the way up to an STC 50, uh, stating that loud speech is, is not audible. Well, an STC 57, obviously, then uh, very, very high performing opening. For a little bit more context, I'm going to show you a, a quick video. This is a video of a PIMCO seal set being tested in an acoustics lab. Uh, the acoustic consultant uh, has configured a communicating door assembly, which is something commonly found in the hospitality environment. And I want you to listen to uh, what's, what's achieved uh, with the PEMCO seals in this configuration. Wow. 
I hope that came across um, in the audio. Um, it's uh, well, the test resulted in an STC 55 uh, for that communicating assembly. Uh, it was pretty impressive. I think the acoustic consultant was was pretty impressed as well. But that puts that 57 into perspective. Exceptionally high performing while still meeting operational code requirements. Uh, but we realized that the STC ratings and acoustics can, can sometimes be difficult to understand with the many different types of seals and assembly configurations available. And so with that in mind, PIMCO's gathered all of this data from the testing that I just spoke about and has compiled it and created prepackaged seal set kits uh, that make it easy to achieve these STC ratings uh, for any door opening uh, that, that uh, you may be designing into your, uh, uh, into your project. The kits are easy to specify and easy to install, so performance and compliance are ensured. And if you're in pursuit of lead, uh, if that's important to you in, in, in your projects, uh, PIMCO's products can help there too. Uh, our acoustic seal sets, as well as many other products in our offering, have achieved Green Guard Gold certification. Um, we're the only manufacturer in, in our um, space in the commercial door seal market to have earned this certification. We're very proud of that. Uh, what, what we can help you earn uh, in your pursuit of lead is indoor environmental quality credits towards that certification. But the commitment to sustainability and acoustics uh, from PIMCO and Asaboy doesn't start and stop with seal sets. Uh, PIMCO products uh, are a part of a a complete acoustic solution offered uh, by Asa Aboy. The complete opening solution uh, for acoustic doors and frames from Asa Aboy includes brands, uh, includes the brands Baron, Seco, Curry's, Frameworks, Graham, Maiman, uh, and S&P. And uh, so if you take those, those products from those trusted brands and couple those with the seal sets from PIMCO, um, we can exceed your project's uh, acoustic requirements uh, and or specifications. So please uh, take advantage of our nationwide network of architectural consultants uh, to help you along with uh, these, these types of acoustic uh, solutions as well as many others. I'll close uh, by inviting you to visit us on the web to learn about this and again the many other solutions offered by Asaboy. I thank you very much for your time and your attention. And uh, again, thanks very much to Julian for the thought provoking talk on sound and its effects on us uh, in the spaces that we design and occupy.